Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the world's most exciting classroom. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I will be your host for today. Last time we caught up with each other, we were in Uruguay, and we had eight amazing Darwin Leader projects on the go. Everything from um, sea turtles to sharks to uh, beach conservation, getting out into the forest, Darwin's toad. We had a lot on the go. And in a little bit, we're going to get to meet one of the Darwin leaders and check out the project that they were working on uh, throughout the week. But I always think it's worthwhile to catch up with the ship. So we are back. We are sailing. We have left uh, Punta del Este in Uruguay, uh, and we are on our way to Puerto Madryn uh, in Argentina. And we have an exciting event coming up next week, which we're really excited about. And we will kind of share all that in a newsletter coming up. But let's zoom in a little bit here and we can see where the ship is right now off the coast of Argentina. We can check out some of the most recent photos. There we go. We've got some people climbing up uh, into the sails, make some adjustments there. Really, really cool. A few more shots here looking up into the sails. They had some great wind recently. So when we talk to Gabriel, uh, we'll get to talk a little bit about what it's like to be sailing the ship. Um, there we go. There's Gabriel. I think the weather's cooled down a little bit. So it looks like he's uh, running out of a little bit of energy there. So very cool. There's the ship. We'll pull out a little bit quickly before uh, we leave. Uh, and we'll just get a feel. Oh, not cooperating with me. There we go. Uh, for what we've been up to. Very, very cool. Okay, let's come back from that screen share. Uh, a shout out to the classrooms who are joining us today. Use that chat sidebar to send in some questions. We'll probably pause a couple times in today's event for questions. Gabriel will have some sharp questions for him and the project he was working on. And then when we bring in the amazing crew at Eden Project in Cornwall, uh, we'll pause as well for a little bit of Q&A action. So don't be shy. Fill that comment section with your questions. Uh, we'll play some Kahoot today. We've got our experiment of the week. We have our curiosity of the week. So lots going on. Let's bring in Gabriel now. He is on board the Ooster Day. Here we go. Hey, Gabriel, how you doing? I'm doing great, Joe. It's good to be here. All right. So I have to ask about that video to start. Is that just, were you out of energy? Is it getting colder? What's going on? Um, so I figured out that when it's really rough out, the best thing to do is to lay on the deck and um, the, the metal on the, on the deck is really, it holds its warmth incredibly well. So laying, I can just warm up. Um, it's quite an enjoyable feeling. So that was me warming up a little bit. All right. Fair enough. So uh, I saw some of the, the stuff coming out on social media. It looked like you guys had some really good wind the last few days. Yeah. The, well, right as soon as we got out of the port, there were big waves. There was at least 20 knots of consistent wind. And we were sailing at almost, I think it was 10 and a half knots right out of the gate, um, which is much faster than we were expecting. So it was, it was a very exciting time. I put the nets up on the side of the boat to keep everyone inside um, so that people wouldn't fall off. And there was there were waves coming over the side. It was, it was a very exciting time. And luckily, it's calmed down a little bit. All right. Sounds pretty great. How's uh, the wildlife going? Have you seen any whales, birds? I know Grant's probably excited about new bird species as you guys head south. Yeah, I can't speak a lot about the birds. It's really more of Grant's department. I know that we've seen a lot of albatross, um, but when I woke up from a nap, I heard someone yell dolphins and I, I ran up to the top of the ship and um, much to my surprise, the dolphins were actually orcas. Um, and wow. there was an orca three feet from the ship that just jumped out and it surprised everyone. Um, but I was really happy to see that. So it was, it was beautiful. All right. Was it too quick? Were you guys able to get a little bit of video? Will we see something on social media? Um, I'm hoping a will come out of it. Only half of the people saw it, so the other half aren't too happy. Um, <laughs> but hopefully, hopefully something will be coming your way. All right. Very, very cool. Well, Gabriel, you were a Darwin leader in uh, Uruguay and Punta del Este. What was it like there? So it was it was a spectacular experience. Um, my project was on shark conservation, um, which is was super important to be there in Uruguay working on that. Um, the hard thing for shark conservation in Uruguay is I came in, I was hoping to go see some live sharks. And what I was told is the only, the only sharks that you can see in Uruguay are dead sharks. So 
there's definitely a lot to be done in shark conservation there. Yeah, sounds like it. So you met your your uh, conservation organization. You spent several days in the field with them. What were some of the highlights? Um, well, one of the biggest highlights was going to Punta del Diablo, which in English is Point of the Devil. And that's where there's tons of artisanal fishermen that are always going out every single day and catching and they're targeting sharks there. So it's really interesting to talk to the fishermen and hear what, what, how long they've been fishing for, what kind of fishing practices they're doing, and a little bit about the struggles of being a shark fisherman and what it would look like if we're hoping to change that trajectory of sharks that are endangered in Uruguay. All right. So in a second, I'm going to play your first video. So we're going to premiere it here on the world's most exciting classroom. Um, and then, yeah, we'll take a few questions. So uh, those who are tuning in, use the chat sidebar. Any questions you have as you're watching the video, we'll get those on deck for Gabriel. But uh, have you had a chance to see it yet? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, we presented it uh, after the last night. So I'm really excited to show it to everyone. I'm looking forward to hearing any questions. Excellent. All right. Well, let's get it going. I'm going to queue it up and here we go. Works often depicted as ferocious hunters of humans. Yet in a harrowing reality, up to 273 million sharks are killed each year, the number quadrupling the population of France. Embarking on an expedition to Uruguay, where Charles Darwin studied natural selection, I investigate these icons of evolution, thriving for 455 million years. However, their future hangs in the balance under a new paradigm of selection. Retracing Darwin's path, I find myself in one of the world's largest shark exporting nations. I, Gabriel Merman, am set to plunge into the depths of shark life. We set off to Punta del Diablo, renowned for its artisanal fishing. Here, we seek insights from the locals, notably Robert Acosta, a seasoned fisherman. Soy pescador artesanal desde que tengo 16 años y no he parado de pescar nunca en ninguna zafra. He notes the stark changes in shark populations in the grim reality of their exploitation. Antes, por ejemplo, teníamos más especies, como el, el coludo que le decimos nosotros, que el que tiene la cola larga, ese ya no hay. El tiburón martillo ya está un poco más extinguido, ya sea por la super pesca de los barcos al anzuelo o los barcos de arrastre que influyen mucho, o la misma pesca artesanal no consciente que depreda mucho. Aproximadamente hace 80 años, los tiburones que salían en las zonas costeras tenían más de un metro hasta tres metros. Ahora, los que van quedando eh, tienen un promedio de un metro y hasta un metro y medio. Locals make pollution's impact on both sharks and fishermen starkly evident. Yet he's not alone in his observations. Another fisherman echoes similar concerns, painting a picture of an ecosystem in peril. Antes, hace un lote de años atrás, muchos años atrás, eh, había mucho más cantidad de pescado. Eh, se salía cerca, se las barcas eran más pequeñas, salía motor fuera a borda. Pero a medida que fueron pasando los años, se ha ido desapareciendo. El pescado que queda es poco, es el mismo de siempre, pero muy poca cantidad. Tenemos una contaminación directa del, de los canales, el canal Andrioni, digo, los transgénicos que están transgenizando todo lo que es los acuícolas, lagunas y ríos por las plantaciones que van al mar. Pero ¿qué pasa si no hay más corvina, no hay más pescadilla, no hay más comida que el tiburón? Si está contaminado todo, ¿qué va a pasar? 
Yo pienso que para que a un pescador te prohíban de pescar el, un tiburón o una especie, primero tienen que ver cómo se ayuda a ese pescador. Porque yo lo único que sé es pescar. Si mañana me prohíben pescar, ¿qué voy a hacer? We're left pondering the current actions addressing this crisis. What is protecting the ancient ocean rulers? The answer may hold the key to their survival or downfall. Stay tuned for the unraveling of this crucial battle for conservation. Let's get Gabriel back in here. Gabriel, there's a beautifully done video, but it must have been hard uh, to see some of those sharks. I mean, as a diver, I love to see them when I'm in the water. So it must have been hard to see them out there after having been caught. Yes, it was not the easiest thing to film. Yeah. So I wonder, you know, this, this is their livelihood. This is how they make a living. Um, it didn't look like a really big fishing fleet. Can you give us an idea of... You know how many people are going out each day to to catch the sharks and other fish? So it's hard to show the scale. The, the next few videos, we'll talk about it a little bit more. But okay. there's 600 artisanal fishermen, all of differing size boats that go fish each day. Yeah. But they really don't make up the majority of the fish that the sharks that are being caught. So there's a huge industrial fishing port out of the capital city of Uruguay, Montevideo. And from there, lots and lots more sharks are caught. And then right outside of Uruguayan waters is where many international fishing vessels from all around the world also catch sharks, which um, Uruguay, as you heard, is one of the biggest shark exporters um, in the world. So they'll come into Uruguay and send all of the sharks from Uruguayan waters and around sharks, in which it's about 44,000 tons each year. So it's a lot of sharks. Wow. Yeah. And I can see how that puts a lot of pressure on those artisanal fishermen who are really kind of just making enough to make a living. Uh, and it's getting harder and harder for them as those big factory ships and uh, other purchasers are, are kind of taking their catch, what they need, their livelihood. Yeah. And I think you mentioned as well in the video that there's there's other issues like uh, pollution kind of going right out into the water and things like that, which is impacting. Is that having an impact on the local ecosystem? Yes, it's having a huge impact. And one of the things we're going to go into the next video um, once we're done with it is people, a lot of the locals eat sharks and one, they don't know they're sharks and two, they don't know the health effects that sharks eating sharks can have on their body. There's elevated levels of heavy metals that can be really damaging to their health. Yeah. And sharks are commonly labeled as different fish, but also people just don't don't register that they're eating sharks. Is it's something they've grown up with being told, oh, this is a fish. Yeah. Um, so they don't associate the name with a shark. All right. Another question here. Um the do did you get a feel for how many species of sharks they were catching how many different species uh so they'll catch any kind of species there is i know there's at least more than 50 species of shark in uruguayan waters um and obviously the number of species that they're finding day in and day out is constantly decreasing yeah yeah that one species they mentioned with the long tail sounded like maybe a thresher shark and they kind of just disappeared completely Yes. All right. Uh, and so if that class, so about 50 species, you think, in that water, and that's that's a pretty biodiverse uh, amount of sharks because there's about somewhere between four to 500 species globally that, that we've, we've named and identified. So uh, those are definitely waters that we should be paying a bit more attention to and, and hopefully getting some protections in place. Yes. And another thing to mention is 
what what the scientists have found is that there's tons of juvenile sharks because it's turned they figured out Uruguay is actually a breeding ground for sharks. Um, in the same places they're fishing, they're catching more and more juvenile sharks. So they're no longer catching the three meter sharks. It's mostly juveniles. So raising that consciousness that people are eating juvenile sharks, which they don't reach full maturity in where they can reproduce until they're about nine, some of these species. So it's, it's really threatening their population. Okay, we've got a class here in Portugal and they're wondering, is it legal for them to be catching the sharks? Are there any laws about sharks? As far as my knowledge, there's very, very little regulation of sharks, shark fishing in Uruguay. It's, it's very focused on um, supporting the fisher, fishing of sharks, um, unfortunately. All right, one more question here from Beth and Miles in the UK. They want to know if you were able to get in the water at all. Did you have a, a chance to get in the water, anything like that during the time? So that's actually, that's a really good question. I, as uh, I do scientific diving, I'm a dive master and I was itching to get in the water and hopefully see some sharks. What I learned is there's a lot of regulation around scuba diving and any, any water related activities. If it's not fishing, it's, it's very hard to get out on the water. So there's only one single dive shop in Uruguay, which is open three or four months out of the entire year. So there's not, because of rules with the Navy here, it's very regulated. So unfortunately I wasn't able to get into the water, hopefully next time. All right, very cool. Well, before we let you go, Gabriel, are we able to take a quick look at the ship today? Let's see what the weather's like. Can we see the yes. ocean? Yeah. Here, I, I have to walk a little. Oh, I think you hit mute. Gabriel, are you able to unmute for us? I think when you stood up, you might have accidentally touched mute on the, the phone. There you go. Okay, you can hear me now. Yeah, we got gotcha. you. And, okay. So if we look on the ship right now, you can see that it's pretty calm out here. We have all of our sails up. Um, and it's just, it's a peaceful day out on the water. Yeah. And we have everyone on watch in the back. Are you finding the temperatures dropping each day as you head further south? Yes. So one, the wind has shifted further south, which means we're getting more of an Antarctic breeze. And yeah, it's definitely feeling much chillier. I could tell a huge difference yesterday. Yeah. And when are you guys expecting to reach Port of Madrid? I believe on the 12th. So the passage is eight days at the rate we left. A few days ago, we would have gotten there in three days, but luckily the wind has calmed down a little bit. <laughs> so very soon. We're, I think we're getting reaching halfway pretty soon. All right. Well, Gabriel, thank you so much for taking us into the project you got to work on. Thanks for showing us the Ooster Scow Day today. Uh, say hi to Susan and Scott, the two Explorers Club folks on board the ship. Uh, and I hope you guys have a great uh, passage and we'll catch up with the ship uh, in about a week on the 14th. Will do. Take care, everyone. All right. Thanks, Gabriel. Bye. See ya. All right. Very cool. Getting to spend a little bit of time uh, on the ship. And oh, I'm just seeing a question here about how old uh, the ship is. So the ship uh, has been through many forms. The Oosterskalde Day um originally was a, a a sailing tall ship but then it was converted into a freighter uh and so there's some really cool pictures on the ship you can actually see uh what it used to look like and then it through some tender love and care and uh a rebuild it was restored back into its three-masted schooner form and it was built in 1918 uh, and it's the largest restored dutch sailing ship so very cool question, a three-masted top sail schooner. Um, and it, it was actually stripped down and converted into a freighter before it was restored back into a three-masted uh, tall ship again, which is amazing. Okay, so a couple of weeks ago, we spent some time in Cornwall in the United Kingdom uh, at the Eden Project. So the Eden Project is an absolutely beautiful spot. 
uh, for education. It is the site of the world's largest indoor rainforest. And last week we connected with Tom and Robbie and they took us into the world of plant adaptations. So I'm gonna bring them in with us again right now. Hey Tom, hey Robbie, how we doing? Hey Joe, great, thank you. Hey Joe, all good? Good stuff. Well, it's great to see you both. Uh, we're excited to explore a little bit more. And I think today we're gonna touch a little bit on, on climate change. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, thanks for having us. Uh, so yeah, I am Robbie and this is Tom and we are live from Eden Project's rainforest biome here in Cornwall. Um, the plan is that we are going to just tell you a quick bit about Eden Project in case you, you, you've you never heard of Eden, just so you know where we're coming from. And then we're going to think a little bit about the relationship between tropical rainforests and climate change. So I'm going to hand over to Tom for a moment, who's going to be able to give you a little bit of that Eden background. Okay. Thanks very much, Robbie. So the picture you can see on the screen in front of you now, everybody, is the picture of the Eden Project site. Um, the building at the front at the moment, this is the education center. This is where I am currently sitting. And the one at the back, this strange bubble-shaped biome, um, is the rainforest where Robbie is coming to you from live today. So as he said, for those of you who haven't heard of Eden Project before or haven't been lucky enough to be here, I'm gonna give you a very quick introduction to our project and the background. So about 25 years ago, um, a man called Tim Smith had the idea of turning this large sandy hole in the ground that you can see in the picture in front of you now into a living theatre for plants and people. He had the idea of using this place to display tropical plants and plants from all over the world for people from all over the world to come and visit. And uh, these are some pictures of our site as the development took place. So you can see in this one here, um, we had to create 85,000 tonnes of soil and we've used that to fill the pit and to enable us to start growing all sorts of plants, some of which we will show you today. And this is pretty much the Eden Project as it looks today. Now we have a mission here at Eden. Everyone who visits us or who we get who we're lucky enough to talk to online, we want to talk to them about the importance of connecting people with nature. Because quite often it's easy to think about nature as being something that's outside somewhere and something that we're apart from. Whereas here at Eden, we want everyone to know you are part of nature. And now is a really important time in the history of our planet to start working together and supporting all living things and in particular plants because after all we are home to two of the biggest greenhouses in the world and that really is going to be the focus of what we talk about uh, today. Right then so here's a quick bird's eye view as I said earlier on Robbie is currently coming to you guys from our rainforest biome which is the largest indoor rainforest in the world so it's over 55 meters high 200 meters wide and there it is chock-a-block full of tropical plants there are over a thousand different species of tropical plants in our rainforest um, unfortunately we won't be able to talk to you about all of them but certainly be able to let you know about some of them today um, rainforests themselves um, are some of the most biodiverse places on the planet. Uh, tropical rainforests around the world are home to 170,000 plant species. And this is more than two thirds of all plant species found on Earth come from tropical rainforests. As I said, they are extremely biodiverse. 50% of all plant and animal species that are found on land are found in tropical rainforests. So they're really biodiverse and really important places. Now then, just before we hand back to Robbie, I want to show you this graphic, because this graphic does an excellent job of summing up what we're going to be talking to you about today. Today, we're going to be talking about the rainforest and the impact that it can have on the world's climate, but also the impact that the climate is currently having on the tropical rainforest. Uh, so we're going to start off by talking about a tree called the oil nut tree. I've got a picture of it here and I know that Robbie is standing fairly close to the oil nut tree in our rainforest biome. This is one of the tallest trees that we have in our biome. It's at over 25 metres tall. But bear in mind, scientists have found trees in the tropical rainforest that are over 100 metres tall. So that's four times the height of the one that Robbie is showing you right now. It's mind blowing to think how tall some of these rainforest trees can be. But as Robbie's about to tell you, they are really important 
in relation to climate and in the response to climate change. So with that, I'm going to hand you back over to Robbie, who's going to tell you a bit more about the oil nut tree. Over to you, Robbie. OK, folks. Um, thank you, Tom. So, yeah, I am stood in front of our famous oil nut tree. It's one of the biggest trees we we have here in our biome. But still, in terms of rainforest trees, as Tom said, it is really only a very still a very small tree. But it, it's a useful tree because we use it to tell stories about the connection between plants and the rainforest and climate and the role that forests play in climate change. So we like to think of trees, not just as trees, but I mean, trees and forests do so many useful things for us in, in our environment. One of the things they do is they catch carbon. So we like to think of trees like this one as a carbon catcher, okay, a carbon catcher. Plants like this absorb carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere as they grow. Now, as I'm sure you guys are aware, um, climate change is linked to, to uh, having too much greenhouse gases in our atmosphere and carbon dioxide is one of those greenhouse gases. So trees and plants and any green plant actually absorbs this gas out of the atmosphere. So how do they do this? Well, it's all about that thing which I expect you've heard of before called photosynthesis. So the leaves of the plant are super important and I'm not going to climb to the top of our all nut tree to find you a leaf because I'll probably fall out. What I'm going to do is just find a leaf much closer to home and we'll use this leaf as our example. So within these leaves, they are underneath the underside of the leaf. There are microscopic holes called stomata. Now, I can't show you with this camera because we need a microscope. But underneath the leaf, there are macroscopic holes and through those holes, gases can be exchanged with the atmosphere. So carbon dioxide gas enters the leaves and then inside the leaves that is combined with water uh, in the presence of sunlight. And through that process, through that combination, through that photosynthesis process, the plant then produces sugars. Now the plant can choose what to do with those sugars. Some of the sugar it's gonna use in respiration to release energy so that the plant can do the things a plant needs to do. But also some of those sugars are going to be converted into solid carbon compounds, which are used to build the tree. So when you look at a tree, here's a tree in front of me here, or if I look back at our oil nut tree, broadly speaking, you could say that 50% of the biomass, the dry mass of that tree is carbon. So it's a massive store of carbon. So these trees, they are carbon catchers and they are also carbon storers. And big trees have the capacity to store an awful lot of carbon. And that has a big impact when we're thinking about addressing climate change. Now, just, just as a, to give you a kind of sense of that, um, here in the UK, we've got an organization called the National Trust. Uh, one of the statistics that they've recently published is that sort of a good rule of thumb is that a tree can remove one ton of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere over its lifetime. Now, the average person in the UK emits about nine tons um, of carbon dioxide throughout the year. OK, so you would need to plant nine of those trees and grow them for the rest of that tree's life to absorb your carbon footprint from one year. OK, Tom, now, is there something else we were going to mention about um, the relationship these plants, these trees and the rainforest also have with with a fungus whilst I make my way to the top of our platform? Absolutely. Thank you, Robbie. Um, so, yeah, indeed, lots of the trees in the rainforest are connected by a specific type of fungus, which is called mycorrhizal fungi. Now, this mycorrhizal fungi grows under the ground. And what it does is it connects the root systems of these trees through the soil. Now, this fungi receives carbon, uh, usually in the form of sugars from the trees. So through that process of photosynthesis that Robbie was talking about a moment ago, some of those sugars are sent down into the ground, sent into the soil and given to uh, to the mycorrhizal fungi. Um, but they also they store carbon as well. So the fungi passes nutrients from the ground up to the tree and in return, it stores some of the carbon that the tree has sequestered from the atmosphere into the soil. 
Um, and this is known as symbiosis or a symbiotic relationship. And this is a mutualistic symbiotic relationship. So where the tree benefits because it's sending some of its carbon down into the ground, but also where the fungi benefits as well because it's a uh, uh, and sorry, the tree benefits because it's also receiving nutrients, but the uh, the fungi also helps because it's storing carbon. So a type of symbiotic relationship. Now, I can see that Robbie is rapidly making his way to the top of the oil nut tree. Um, he's gone a little bit fuzzy at the moment, so hopefully we'll see him properly in just a moment. Uh, but when he gets to the top, he's going to tell you a little bit more about the relationship between large rainforest trees like this one and the climate. So I think we've got you back. Robbie, are you still there? Are you able to hear us? You might be on mute at the moment, Robbie. Oh, it looks like we've lost him for a moment, guys. So we're going to see if we can get Robbie back. Um, but for now, you're going to you're you're stuck with me for a little bit longer, which is absolutely fine. So as I said, Robbie was making his way up to our canopy walkway, which is right at the top of our rainforest. So he started off at the bottom, uh, near the bottom of the oil nut tree, and now he's going to make his way to the top. So fingers crossed, I can see he's uh, making his way back in. I can hear him there. So hopefully, in just a second, we'll get back to Robbie. It looks as if his signal has cleared up. A little bit which is excellent robbie can you hear us now absolutely yeah thanks tom i had to do a mad dash on our aerial walkway and i think as i did so i uh across the rope bridge and whatnot um i uh i lost signal but i'm i'm back I don't know where we've got to, though, Tom. <laughs> so, to be honest, I was just saying to everyone that we'd lost you for a second and they had to put up with me. Um, I was explaining that you were making that journey to the top of the tree, but I haven't actually got much further than that. So um, over to you now to tell us a little bit more about the relationship between these big rainforest trees and the climate, as you were planning to do when you got to the top anyway. Excellent. OK, thanks, Tom. So I'm on the top of our aerial walkway and I guess in a real rainforest, in our rainforest, we're kind of at canopy level. But in a real rainforest, we, we wouldn't be at canopy level yet. We'd still be sort of understory up towards um, towards the canopy. Um, but the canopy is the principal site for gas exchange between the plants and the atmosphere. So remember, we talked about those stomata, the microscopic holes on the underside of the leaves and the gases of water vapour and the carbon dioxide and oxygen can can um can move through those pores um and so it's kind of where the, the gases make their way from the plant or into the plant from the atmosphere um but there's another way that plants um, are a really important part of the story when it comes to climate change um, and it's through the story of the water cycle so if i look at our oil nut tree so we've got a big banana those giant banana plants uh, banana leaves there but if, if, I, if you look through those ooh, if you look through the leaves um, you can see the oil nut tree again that we've stood at the bottom of well this oil nut tree is sucking up huge quantities of water from the soil and that water is going up the up the uh, xylem vessels in the tree and it's going into the leaves uh, at the top of the oil nut tree now as it go enters the leaves a lot of that water, although some of it will be used in photosynthesis, some of it's also going to be used um, to keep the plant cool. Because just like people, plants effectively sweat. One of the ways the trees keep cool is that water evaporates through the leaves, through the stomata, into the atmosphere. And when it does that, it has a cooling effect on the plant. In the same way, this has a cooling effect on the atmosphere. Now, not only that, but when the water vapour enters the atmosphere, it generates massive clouds and these clouds form above rainforests. Now, these clouds um, have, uh, actually have a reflective effect. It's called the albedo effect and they reflect sunlight back out of the atmosphere, back out into space. So we can really think of these forests and these trees as also being water sweaters and sun reflectors. So again, helping to keep the planet cool. They're effectively acting as a, a giant air conditioning system for planet Earth. So it's super important. And I suppose the other really important thing to remember as well is that with all this warm, moist air rising above our tropical rainforests, that also creates and it drives air currents and circulation patterns and weather patterns across the, the whole regions of the globe. So they are also air movers 
and these forests are also rainmakers. So super important. And I think it's really, if we use that analogy, it's just, we want to think about the importance of rainforest and climate change. Just to think of them as a giant air conditioning system is, is a really great analogy to hold in mind. Okay. I'm going to hand back to Tom for a moment, I think. Are you there, Tom? Yeah, I'm here, Robbie. Thank you very much. So even though it's been a little bit of a whistle-stop tour, um, we can see that rainforests really do af affect climate. So through those processes of photosynthesis and transpiration, we have seen how the rainforest is having an impact on the climate. Um, and But the opposite is also true. So as well as rainforests impacting the climate, the climate is also having an impact on rainforests. And scientists are worried about the impacts of climate change and the impacts they'll have on the rainforest. So for example, due to climate change, we're seeing um, periods of droughts, we're seeing more tropical storms um, and all sorts of other um, negative effects as well. And this can be quite a scary thought, but it's important to know that there are millions of people all around the world who are working to take action to help the climate and to protect the rainforest. And we can all join in and we can all take action too in our daily lives. Quite often it's easy to feel powerless, but actually there are all sorts of things we can do. And we've got a top tip for you here. So looking again at our rainforest graphic, that the one that I've displayed on the screen, it's important to remember that action that we take to help look after the rainforest, ones like these, so buying careful products, avoiding certain food outlets, um, buying things that maybe have logos on them of companies that support the rainforest, like Rainforest Alliance, and having important conversations like the one we're having today, if we're taking actions to protect the rainforest, that will also have an impact on the world's climate. And in return, in reverse, anything that we do to help the climate, so for example, considering our travel plans, walking more dry, uh, rather than driving or going on aeroplanes, making sure we switch things off and saving electricity, recycling and reusing things in our everyday lives, these sorts of actions can also have a positive impact on the rainforest as well as on the climate. So it's really important to remember that we all have an important part to play in this story and we can all do things and everything that we do matters and is really important. OK, I think I've summed that up well, Robbie. I'm going to hand back to you. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Uh, I guess the other thing that just popped into my mind is just the idea that it's really helpful and useful if we think in terms of systems and how actually, you know, imagine the rainforest as part of the carbon cycle and the rainforest is part of the water cycle. And also imagine ourselves as part of those systems as well. And everything that we do in our lives has an impact on those global systems. And when we really start to use that kind of systems thinking, we can really work together on, on the right sorts of solutions. OK, so hopefully we told you a little bit about Eden really briefly. And we've also tried to go into a little bit of detail about just why tropical rainforests are so important when it comes to the fight against climate change. Um, I think we're just about done. So I think we're going to hand back over to you, Joe. All right. Excellent. Robbie, Tom, thank you so much for an awesome presentation, an awesome exploration uh, through Eden. What I think we'll do now is we'll open it up to the students. So there's the chat sidebar on the side. If you send in your questions about the rainforest, we will work some of those in. But I think it might be fun as well, while we're waiting for a few questions to come in, is to uh, play our Kahoot together as well, because a lot of the questions are based uh, on today's event. So I'm going to load that up here. There we go. It's loading now. Um, and I will shout out some reminders here as we get ready to start playing. First of all, uh, you can see that I ready for the Kahoot. Then it's going to ask you for a PIN number. So in this case, um, 596-9957 is going to get you ready to go for the Kahoot. We're going to have some true and false, some multiple choice questions. The faster you put your answer in, and if it's right, the more points you are going to get. If you are at a seat, uh, in your classroom, you can uh, use one-to-one -one technology, maybe a Chromebook, maybe an iPad. 
if you don't have something like that handy, your teacher could put this up at the front of the room. You could shout out your answers to him or her. Uh, and then if you're at home, you can scan the QR code. Maybe you have your mobile phone handy. Uh, maybe you have something like uh, a tablet. You can give it a quick scan and you will be ready to go. So as we uh, wait for a few more classes or students to come in and join us, let's get a couple questions going for Eden. So uh, the first question here uh, that we have is about wildlife. Is there any wildlife in the rainforest at Eden? Um, I think I will answer that one um, because Robbie is also still on mute. So <laughs> we'll give my best go. There is some wildlife. Now, um, we're not a zoo. We want to showcase plants here at Eden. So we haven't got kind of all sorts of animals making their way around the rainforest, but we do have some and we have them in there as a form of biocontrol. So rather than using lots of chemicals to kill off pests, which might be damaging the plants we have in our collection, we actually try and control those pests using animals. So some of the favourites that you might see, we've got uh, rule rule birds, which are a, gr a ground dwelling type of bird, which make their way around the bottom of the rainforest, um, often digging up the soil and eating pests that they find. Um, they're a type of partridge, so kind of quite small, maybe about this kind of size, um, but they're certainly very popular with lots of our visitors. We've also got things like frogs, um, we've got geckos, um, and we've got smaller birds which fly around in the canopy of the rainforest as well. So even though we're not a zoo, we do have some wildlife, some animals in there to help control our rainforest. All right, very cool. Okay, well, we've got a few students, a few classrooms in here. Uh, so let's get, oh, we've got a couple more popping in, but let's uh, let's get going because we want some time for a few more questions too. So uh, 20 seconds for each question. The quicker you put your answer in, uh, the more points you're gonna get. So let's go. First question, sharks have been around for about, what did Gabriel tell us? 100 million years, 200 million years, 300 million years, or 400 million years? About how long have sharks been around for? One, two, three, or 400 million years? All right, the correct answer is over 400 million years before uh the dinosaurs came along and they are still here with us practically unchanged they are absolutely amazing uh creatures so the caring seal is in first place we'll jump to our next question it's a true and false fishermen are catching bigger and bigger sharks each year in uruguay so was that true or false that each year the fishermen are catching bigger and bigger sharks uh in uruguay Got a couple more seconds on the clock All right, that is false. The uh, older sharks, the one to three meter sharks have been fished out. Now they're catching the juvenile sharks, which is a bad situation because those sharks haven't had a chance to reproduce. So the numbers are gonna fall faster and faster each year. The green impala is in first place. We'll jump to our next question. About how much tons of soil did it take to fill in the Eden site? Remember, it was that giant pit before? Was it 10,000 tons, 50,000 tons, 85,000 tons, or 110,000 tons? So about how much soil did it take? 10,000, 50,000, 85,000, or 110,000 tons? All right, that correct answer was about 85,000 tons. Remind me, Tom, about how long did it take to fill in the site? Um, so construction itself took about two and a half years. Um, so yeah, it took quite a long time to fill in the whole pit. All right, caring seal is in top. Oh, we've got a two and false coming your way. Two thirds of all plant species are found in tropical rainforest. Is that true uh, or is that false? About two thirds of all plant species are found in tropical rainforest. All right, three more seconds on the clock. All right, good job, crew. That is absolutely true. And about a thousand species uh, at Eden Project, which is absolutely amazing. Caring Seal is holding that top spot. We've got one more question to go, and then we'll take a couple more questions before we let our crew 
uh, carry on with their day. So the openings on the bottom of leaves are called roots, stomata, chloroplasts, or fruits. So the openings on the bottom of leaves where gases exchange, where water uh, moves out through transpiration. Are they roots? Are they stomata? Are they chloroplasts? Or are they fruits? Another clue is sometimes they're called guard cells. All right, stomata is uh, the right answer. And then they open and close with those guard cells that they have on the outside. Very, very cool. Let's see our podium. In third place, we have the champion stork. In second place, we've got the green impala. And holding down that top spot, we have the caring seal. All right. If you are the caring seal, you want to send an email to eb2soyp at gmail.com and we will send you uh, your Amazon gift card. A huge shout out to everybody who played along with us today. Uh, and let's wrap up with one or two more questions with Rob and Tommy, uh, or sorry, Tom. And so <laughs> we will uh, go with this one here. You said a tree can hold about a ton of carbon uh, over its, was it lifetime or over a year, Robbie? Uh, so over its lifetime, we're talking about sort of a tree growing in uh, the average kind of tree in a UK woodland over its lifetime would would um, absorb and store away one one ton of carbon. All right. So if we take that tree down, if it's removed, if it's logged, what happens to that carbon that the tree was storing? Uh, I mean, it depends. Um, so, you know, obviously, if a forest with a forest fire if a, or if a forest is burnt for some reason, because um the you know, forest got a, a fire got out of control then as soon as it burns then that carbon is released straight back into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide um if that that timber is then taken and used to make furniture out of or something like that then that carbon is still stored in that wood but at some point it will rot away it will just take a lot longer you know wooden products don't last forever and eventually the, the carbon would be returned to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide in the end but uh, I guess the, the, the big the big point is that um, if you remove these, these trees and these giant trees in the rainforest, you know, they store a lot of the carbon, but they also have the capacity to continue as they carry on growing, they will store more and more carbon. So they're really important and valuable. Yeah, absolutely. All right. One more question here. You mentioned that the rainforest is uh, like a giant air conditioning for the planet. We know that we are losing uh, you know, rainforest daily uh, to things like, you know, uh, clearing for cattle um, and other purposes. So are we starting to see some of those effects now? Are, are there studies that show we're starting to see uh, a temperature change due to the loss so far? Yeah, I mean, the science is clearly showing us that, you know, climate change is happening. We're seeing those um, raise that that rise in, te in global temperatures and deforestation is is part of the reason why we are we are seeing that you know if we if we degrade forests and and they burn or they are destroyed and they they uh, rot away then that will return carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and at the same time you've removed the forest so it's no longer absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere so it's kind of a, a double-edged problem there all right well, Robbie and Tom, thank you so much for being with us today, taking us into Eden. It is such a beautiful place. I can hear the water. I hear birds in the background. Uh, here in Canada, where I had to shovel my driveway uh, this morning to get rid of the snow, uh, it's nice to virtually visit Eden uh, and see this amazing learning place you've sent that tens of thousands of students get to explore and learn about the rainforest every year. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much for having us. Um, we, you know, we love uh, love talking to you and love talking to your audience. So thanks for having us. All right. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Awesome. Have a great rest of the week, guys. And hopefully we'll catch up with you as the Easter Scale Day plows its way uh, around the world and through the oceans. Thanks, guys. Excellent. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, everyone. Bye. All right. Very cool. A great visit to Eden. Uh, plan adaptations a few weeks ago and now learning about just how important these amazing rainforests are for our planet. So let's take a little look at our experiment. Two weeks ago, we looked at a sea ice experiment. So we had ice uh, on land versus ice that was already in the water. And we looked at the impact. Uh, it happened when that ice melted, how it changed 
the ocean in our little mini ocean that we set up. So let's take a quick look here and see what our results were for this experiment. Welcome back. What results did you find in your rising sea level experiments? Let's have a look at my two setups here. You might remember that I drew a mark representing the, the level of the water in my Arctic setup and my Antarctic setup. You might also recall that the ice was floating in the Arctic setup, but on land in the Antarctic setup. This represents the sea ice of the Arctic and the ice sheets on land in the Antarctic. Well, we can clearly see that the level has actually risen significantly in the setup representing the Antarctic ice sheet. But it hasn't risen really at all in the setup representing the Arctic sea ice. Did you work out the reason why? The answer is quite simple. Ice actually expands when it freezes. However, the amount of ice above the water when it floats is roughly the same as the amount of volume that the ice expands by. So when it melts, the volume of the water is more or less the same. This explains why the melting ice hasn't changed the level of the water in my container. However, the ice representing the ice sheets of Antarctica is completely different. All of that ice is above the level of the water on land so that when it melts, the water trickles down and raises the level of the container. This simple experiment showcases some of the processes that are taking place at the North and South Polar regions. The melting of the sea ice around Antarctica and the Arctic regions has relatively little impact on the rising sea levels of our world. However, the melting of the ice sheets of Antarctica and to a lesser extent Greenland and other areas around the world, has a massive impact on the rising sea levels of the oceans. Since Charles Darwin's journey in 1831, sea level is thought to have risen around 20 centimetres. However, with the ongoing melting of ice sheets around the world, particularly the Antarctic ice sheet, it's thought that global sea levels could rise as much as 70 metres by the year 2100. Imagine the impact that will have on coastal cities, coastal communities, and coastal habitats. Did All right, very cool. I hope you tried in your classrooms or at home uh, that experiment, and I hope those results were uh, interesting for your, for your classrooms, for your students, that the ice in the Arctic that's already in the ocean, uh, when it does melt, it doesn't change the the level of the water because it's already in the water. It's already displaced that amount uh, of, of volume in the water. But coming from land, uh, glaciers and things like that in Antarctica, Greenland and other places, that's where you see the really big impact uh, as it runs from the land into the ocean and then raises those sea levels around the world. Here comes our experiment for this week. Remember, with our experiments, you have two weeks to submit your answers to the experiments for your chance at a 50 pound gift card. We take the top three responses. Let's take a look at this week's experiment. Welcome back everyone. This week's experiment explores the different conditions that plant seeds need in order to germinate and grow. Every species of plant on earth has slightly different conditions and requirements in order for it to grow healthily and the seeds to germinate. Some plant species grow only in freshwater conditions. Others are tolerant of salt. Others like warm temperatures or cold temperatures and some can tolerate shadowy conditions and shade. Well, in this experiment, we're gonna have a little look at some of those differing conditions. The first thing you need is the seeds of a plant that's fast growing. I really recommend cress seeds. Cress grows really quickly, so it's perfect for this experiment. Then you need to decide on what conditions you're going to run in this experiment to test the requirements of those seeds. 
I'm going to try and germinate seeds with fresh water, with fresh water but using a dish to make shadow or shade, and last but not least, salty conditions using table salt that you can have at home. Okay, the first step you need to do is create some matrixes for the seeds to germinate on. Paper towel works really, really well. So if you fold it up and put it into your dishes, and then I recommend adding a little bit of water just so that it holds the, the tissue paper down and the seeds then can stick to it quite nice and easily. So I've got those three ready. You don't have to use dishes, by the way. You could use any type of container. You could even use uh, glass cups if you so prefer, or Petri dishes. But having a nice open bowl like this makes it very easy to observe. Then get roughly the same quantity of seed. I'm using a teaspoon here. And sprinkle those evenly onto your paper towels. It doesn't matter exactly how many seeds you, you germinate. You'll see the trends in the germination quite clearly and quite, quite easily as they start to grow. Perfect. So for my first control, I'm going to add fresh water only. So let's add a little bit of fresh water here and see if those seeds grow. Don't inundate the seeds with water. You certainly don't want them to be floating, but you do want the entire paper towel to be wet so that all of the seeds are in contact with moisture. For my second experiment, I'm going to look at how shady conditions impact seed germination. I've got this little, little dish here that I'll put on top of my bowl to see how those dark conditions impact the germination. But first, add in a little bit of water to make that paper towel sufficiently moist so that all of the seeds are in contact with some moisture. Then I'll put that dish on top and we'll see if we get any germination in dark conditions. Last but not least, I really would like to test and see if salt impacts the germination of those seeds. So get a beaker, pour in a little bit of water, add some salt, table salt from your, your dining table at home will work absolutely fine. I'm going to put in four little spoonfuls full. It doesn't really matter the exact quantity, but just make sure you give it a good mix so that it all dissolves so that you have a nice solution of that salt to test the impact on those seeds. When the salt is dissolved, pour in a bit of that salt solution so that it definitely gets absorbed by the tissue paper. And then we'll see if salt water impacts the germination of those cress seeds. Now place your three dishes in a location that's brightly lit and warm. And make sure that all three dishes have exactly the same conditions so that it's a fair test. So you get a, a really good overview of the differences in germination. You have to leave them alone for about four to five days, but then come back and see if there's any differences in the germination of these seeds. Join me in two weeks time to see the results of this experiment. You can do this at home and send in your results by completing the information sheet on the darwin200.com website. Send in your results over the next two weeks for a chance to win three £50 Amazon voucher prizes. Good luck and see you in two weeks to find out the results of this exciting experiment. All right, there we go. There's our experiment. You have two weeks to do the experiment to send in your results. Classroom at darwin200.com. Remember, it's two weeks for the experiment. Next week, we will look at the results uh, of our yeast experiment. So yeast feeding and what process is happening uh, and how we can observe that process. Send in your answers to classroom at darwin200.com. You can always find the experiment if you want to watch it. There's a playlist of the experiments uh, on our YouTube page uh, as well. Okay, to wrap up today, we are going to take a little look at last week's curiosity of the week and then we will challenge students with this week's curiosity. So let's see the answer to last week's. Back last week, I asked you to try and guess the identity of this strange object. Now, I do know it looks a little bit rude, like someone's bottom, but it is a serious question what this object is. Did you guess correctly? Well, it's actually the world's largest seed. This is called the Coco de Mer. It's from the Seychelles Islands in the Indian Ocean.
It's related to the coconut, but it's a different species, although it does grow at the top of a palm tree, a bit similar to a coconut. Believe it or not, when the Coco de Mer was first observed by French and other European sailors several centuries ago, they actually couldn't believe or understand where such a big seed came from. The French sailors actually thought that there were giant coconut trees growing underwater in the sea. And that's why it's called the Coco de Mer, which of course in French means coconut of the sea. Well, this was a bit difficult to identify. Now let's find out this week's curiosity and see if you can guess it correctly. All right, last week's curiosity was the world's largest sea, the Coco de Mer. Let's take a look at this week's curiosity. Back everyone. Can you guess what this object here is? It's a very strange, curious object. And if you look really closely, you'll see it has a very, very intricate structure. It consists of a lattice of these white fibers. They're actually made out of silica. So it's very unusual. Join us in one week's time to find out the answer of this curiosity. All right, there we go. You can always find the curiosities on our YouTube channel. There is a playlist of the curiosities if you need to take a look at the videos again. And don't forget, you have one week to get your answer for this week's curiosity, classroom at darwin200.com. Two weeks for the experiments, which means you have one week left for last week's uh, experiment with yeast, and you have two weeks for this week's experiment with crest seeds in the different growing conditions. And then we have our new curiosity of the week, which we will be seeing the answer for next week. Next week, we will be live in Puerto Madryn. We hope you can join us there as we explore some amazing conservation work there. And then I am going to uh, end things off with a shout out to our sponsors. Our sponsors and our partners make all of this possible, bringing the Darwin leaders to the ship to learn and create their videos. Um, and then of course, our world's most exciting classroom. So let's say a big thank you to our partners before we sign off for today.